recognize you from, okay. maybe yeah. just saw you in the halls at the time at the yeah. library. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, conversation on public access to CRS reports. Uh, before we start with the panel, I'd like to introduce Representative Mike Quigley from Illinois. Uh, in addition to representing family of mine, he also is the co-chairman of the Congressional Transparency Caucus, uh, which he co-founded uh, along with uh, Congressman Issa. He is a relentless champion for openness and transparency in government. Uh, the author of numerous bills from the Transparency and Government Act to a resolution with Mr. Lance on public access to Sierra's reports. He tells a fantastic story about his predecessors, that, who's, of which I will not steal the thunder from. Um, and he is uh, really one of the inspiring members of Congress. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Congressman Quigley. Good morning. Uh, for those of you who might be in the wrong room, this is not the Benghazi hearing. <clears throat> uh, as the founder of the Transparency Caucus, I'm pleased to announce that we'll have an additional Transparency Caucus meetings at undisclosed locations, at undisclosed times, and we're going to write reports and let nobody read them. That's how it would be if we followed the lead of Congress. Uh, fortunately, we're trying to change all that. and. Uh, I want to thank Daniel Schumann from Demand Progress for moderating this and for his efforts toward this end, and for our panelists for being here. <clears throat> Look, uh, disclosing the CRS reports isn't the end-all, be-all. It's not going to solve all our problems, but it addresses the greater problem here in our country, and it's that distrust of government. Right, I come from Illinois. Um, well, I went on Colbert, and the first thing he asked me was, so Quigley, your predecessor, Bogoyevich, Rostenkowski, have you picked out your prison yet? <laughs> There's no really good answer to that. <clears throat> and you know it's bad when you hear corruption jokes from members from Louisiana and Jersey. Um, <clears throat> so what I've discovered coming from Illinois is that the real cost of corruption is the loss of the public's trust. And other than behaving appropriately, I don't know how to react to that other than to listen to Justice Brandeis' advice that you've all heard that sunlight is the best of disinfectants. We need to have government as open as possible, as transparent as possible, so folks know why we're doing what we're doing. How, what are we basing our decisions on, right? And as soon as you tell someone you can't have something, and as soon as you allude to the fact that it's difficult to get a report, people's worst suspicions are arisen. So that's what we're trying to confront here. And it's, a, it's not particularly easy at this point in time, but it's well worth it. We have to recognize that the American public is no longer informed by the likes of Cronkite or Murrow. It is uh, they're being informed by pundits and ideologues. And they're not getting the hardcore information uh, on how to base our decisions and how they should look at government. Opening CRS to the public would empower our constituents with vital information about key issues, policies, and budgets we're debating here in Congress. Increasing government transparency and giving the public the tools they need to hold their own government accountable. That's why Representative Lance and I introduced House Resolution 34 which directs the clerk of the House to maintain a centralized public database for non-confidential CRS reports. I'm talking about the general reports that CRS publishes every day, which are already available to the public if requested through our offices. But it's hard to get those reports, and a small industry has sprung up selling these reports, which is contrary to what we'd like to do. For example, for-profit businesses often offer access to the research services content to subscribers for a handsome fee. This isn't a real solution to our problem. Instead, we are creating a more divided electorate. It's simply good public policy to allow educators, students, the news media, and everybody, and everyday citizens access to these reports. It is one step in a long path toward regaining the public's trust. So I want to thank those who are involved and encourage your participation and we will let you know when we meet again. Thank you so much. So
So, and with that, uh, Representative Lance uh, will be coming to speak as well, but I don't see him in the room at the moment. So, uh, what I'll do is I'll introduce our panelists and we'll start the conversation. And when the Congressman gets here, uh, we, we will pause uh, so that he can have some, make some remarks as well. So, let me introduce our panel. Uh, you have longer descriptions on your seats, uh, so I won't get into it. Uh, we have uh, Representative Chris Shays, a uh, Republican from Connecticut, uh, from my home state, who is a longtime advocate for public access to CRS reports, one of the original leaders uh, on this issue. Uh, next to him is Stan Brand, who was counsel for the House of Representatives in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, is currently in practice at Aiken Gump. Uh, we have Kevin Kosar, who is uh, at R Street Institute, which is a libertarian think tank. But for 11 years, he was a analyst and manager at the Congressional Research Service. And next to him is Drew Adler, uh, the Associate Executive Director I, uh, at the Association of Research Librarian, uh, Libraries. I always get the L in libraries confused. Uh, she has worked for the legislative branch in a number of capacities, but she's been with ARL since the mid 80s. Late 80s, thank you. Uh, so with that, I'm going to start with Representative Shays. You've been working on this issue of all of us, I think, probably the longest. Why should CRS reports be available to the public? I'm going to first say that uh, what I missed, uh, what I miss almost more than anything else, uh, being a member of Congress, was every day you learn new things. You know, you learn it from your constituents, you learn from lobbyists, and hopefully you're getting lobbyists on both sides of the equation. Uh, you learn from your staff, obviously, and when people write you and you don't know about an issue, I say that members of Congress know a little about everything because we have to vote on everything, and then we specialize in a few areas. So I remember uh, asking my staff about a particular issue, and they did great work, and they were looking down at their notes and kind of telling me something and looking down at their notes. I said, where do you get those notes from? He said, well, I, um, I contacted the Congress Research Office, and I said, Hey, that's terrific, and these are great notes. Uh, next time, invite them to join you. Um, and I realized that these researchers spend decades on just a few issues, but they know it more in depth, and they truly try to be not just, th they are thorough and informative, uh, but they try to also be honest. They try, to, they try to make sure that they're not letting their own bias come through. You know, they're not running for public office. They're not trying to be celebrities. Uh, they just are putting it out there. Um, and so the obvious fact is that um, Jefferson said, we're going to have a library of Congress that's going to help educate members who are elected representatives. Well, part of the job of representatives is to help educate the public. And what better way to do it than to let them have access to these documents of people. And I'll make one other last point, and that is, besides having access to it, it's also important that people who may disagree can say, yes, but they didn't look at this or they didn't look at that. Uh, I think they could help make the reports better in some instances. So um, to me, this is motherhood and apple pie. I mean, it's like, uh, just do it. <laughs> let it be available to the public. And that's what we did. On a trial basis in my office, we had all the CRS reports in my office, and people could access from my office whatever they wanted. So I thank those of you who have been involved in this effort. It's really an important one. Would you talk about that pilot program just a little bit more, uh, how it worked and how you set it up? You know, I love this. The key is to have good staff, and they do it. <laughs> so we should have had my staff come here, but I, the general gist of it was that all these reports, or almost all of them, were uh, on, on my uh, web page. And people could go in, connect to the Library of uh, to Congress, the CRS, and they could get the reports that they wanted to get. And uh, it was on a trial basis, and I don't know why it was dropped, because it worked darn well. Thank you. And, and that pilot project actually was just stopped last year uh, from a, it was a funding issue. Uh, but members of Congress didn't know that it existed. Uh, that was actually one of the really interesting things is that this pilot program where you could have CRS make reports available through member sites. Uh, CRS never told anyone that it existed because <laughs> that was not need to know information. So uh, one, of the, one of the questions that often comes up and that CRS often raises as an issue is speech or debate costs. So we have 
Stan Brand, who was counsel for the House of Representatives, to hopefully explain whether this is an issue for public access to CRS reports and, and sort of how that issue plays out. First, my apologies to Congressman Quigley. He probably did not know when I was invited that I represented Dan Rostenkowski um, during that case, and as well as uh, Jesse Jackson's staff doing the Bulgojevich grand jury, so I apologize for, for that. Um, uh, in a word, um, the speech or debate clause applies regardless of whether CRS makes a determination to make any of this stuff public. Um, and their letter seems to imply that by making this available, you, in, in their words, eventually put the protections of the clause at risk Actually, nothing could be further from the truth because Congress acts in public in all kinds of ways. So when it has a hearing, it's public. That does not mean that anyone can subpoena the members of the staff it, with respect to anything that occurs in preparation for that hearing or at that hearing. So the fact that it's public is simply a byproduct of the legislative process. Um, and I always give the famous case of the United States versus Gravel to, to make that point. Senator Gravel placed in the record of the Buildings Committee that he uh, chaired the entire Pentagon Papers uh, in the 1970s, a classified report on the war in Vietnam. He was subpoenaed, his aide was subpoenaed you know, to the I'm grand gonna jury. I'm going to do what the staff is doing. You have your congressman here. We're going to yeah. let him, yeah. yes. Thank you. This is the only microphone I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, good morning. I'm Leonard Lance, and I'm uh, pleased to be here. I'm, I'm just out of a meeting with uh, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, Congressman Ryan, uh, who, who uh, he is still chairman of Ways and Means, but. Uh, <laughs> Given uh, the group with which I am associated, we are unanimously in support of his uh, <coughs> election as a Speaker of the House, and I go out on a limb and predict that he will become the Speaker of the House uh, sometime next week. Um, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, the Transparency Caucus, I think we're all in favor of that. Um, uh, according to uh, Research we've done in our office, American taxpayers spend more than $100 million a year supporting the work of the Congressional Research Service <coughs> uh, regarding reports, analysis, and other public documents. And it seems to us, uh, those of us who are advocating on behalf of this issue, that it is good public policy to allow educators, students, members of the news media, and American citizens' uh, access to CRS's nonpartisan taxpayer-funded reports. Uh, this issue is bipartisan, and that's why uh, I'm pleased to join uh, Representative Quigley in championing legislation to make this happen. Um, I think CRS uh, is governed by requirements of accuracy, objectivity, balance, and nonpartisanship, the very sort of analysis sought and valued by uh, constituents across uh, the country. And from our perspective, the fix is really simple, uh, uh, to have access and accessibility to the CRS website, and this will have little or no cost to the American taxpayer. It's important to note that we are not talking about private requests. Our constituents often ask of our office. That research and those inquiries will, of course, remain confidential between constituents and their member of Congress. CRS provides the best possible information and analysis on which to base the policy decisions uh, that to confront the nation, and Congressman Quigley and I believe that information should be available publicly. Public debate has become increasingly partisan and polarized, and it is more important than ever for uh, the American people to have full access uh, to neutral, unbiased information that many of us rely upon to help formulate uh, important decisions. Opening CRS to the public will empower our constituents with vital information about key issues, policies, and budgets. Uh, I uh, am very uh, hopeful that our legislation will be able to move forward, and I'm pleased to be with you this morning, and uh, I certainly commend the, the panel for, for its fine work. Uh, are there questions of me? Thank you very much. Uh, on to uh, 
on to the election of a new speaker. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, the, the resolution is HRES 34, uh, which is Mr. Lance and Mr. Quickly calling for uh, public access to CRS reports. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just to round out uh, briefly, the, so the, the, the law is clear that no matter what the status of an act is public or not, it is still protected by the clause if it is legislative. Um, and I'd say, uh, add two thoughts to that. If there is concern, that the clause and the protection of the staff be extended to a review in court. It's very simple to put a sentence in the resolution that says, nothing herein shall be deemed or considered to diminish, qualify, condition, waive, or otherwise affect applicability of the Constitution, speech or debate clause, or any other privilege available to Congress, its agencies, or their employees, to any CRS product made available on the internet under this bill. That will signal to the review in court that this is something they need to worry about. And I'll give you one historical example. In 1981, when I was a very young fellow with hair and counsel to the um, Speaker of the House, the House of Representatives, an employee was subpoenaed by the Justice Department in a pending criminal case in Philadelphia involving uh, then Congressman Eilberg, um, subpoenaing documents and testimony with respect to advice that the Congressman had asked the CRS to review in an attempt to demonstrate that the congressman's intent to commit a federal crime was uh, present because he had ignored the advice given to him by the CRS. I went to the speaker and the joint leadership group um, and sought authorization to move to quash the subpoena. It was granted. We went to court. We made all the arguments that had to be made, at which point the Department of Justice withdrew the subpoena. So to the extent that anyone is afraid that making uh, these reports public will, will weaken the clause, the first answer is it won't because the case law is clear. Two, it can be strengthened by putting the caveat into the resolution that I suggested. And thirdly, with House and Senate legal counsel being vigilant to assertion of the privilege and protection and full authorization to defend any CRS employee or, or uh, group that gets subpoenaed for documents or testimony, it shouldn't be a problem. So in my view, uh, nothing, uh, nothing uh, that the resolution would do with respect to the transparency issue is going to affect the clause in one bit. Let me just ask a quick follow-up question. So uh, the Senate Rules Committee has a long-standing statement, uh, 20 years, encouraging members of Congress to put CRS reports on their websites. Um, should this resolution uh, be enacted or something similar that requires the clerk or some other entity that's not CRS to make the reports available on their website, would this in any way adversely affect the way uh, the, the current speech or debate clause protections or would things be essentially, you know, at least as they are now? they would be essentially the same. The way a report is made available to the depository libraries and online. Um, the, the, in, and the Supreme Court has spoken to that in several cases. So the subsequent publication within the Congress of reports, hearings, et cetera, does not constitute a waiver of that privilege. So Kevin, uh, you were at CRS for 11 years, which is 11 times longer than I made it. How come how many reports you wrote? How many, well, okay, so first part is how many reports did you write? And the second question I'd like to ask is, what is your perspective as a uh, former CRS employee and manager with respect to public access to the reports? And could you also talk a little bit about the letter that came out today? Sure, sure, let me start with the latter one because otherwise I'll forget. Um, the letter that came out today was a letter signed by a number of former CRS employees, many of them retirees with long service. Collectively, these individuals had more than 500 years of uh, service to Congressional Research Service, and they signed on to a letter saying, yes, we should have uh, de jour, as opposed to just de facto, public access to CRS reports. Um, so that kind of ties into the 
issue that sometimes gets floated out there, uh, which is characterize it as, well, if CRS reports are made public, maybe it will harm the content of the reports in some way, shape, or form. And uh, I take issue with it because I think the premise is fundamentally faulty. Uh, we have de facto public access to CRS reports. Uh, it's just that most of America doesn't know where to look for them. There are some 27,000 copies of CRS reports scattered over various .gov websites. Uh, but they're not centralized. They're not easily found. It's only people who know where to look for them are able to locate them. Uh, so what we're proposing is not really a change in uh, type. It's a kind of change in degree. It's a change in uh, access to make it more democratic and, quite frankly, a little bit more sensible. Um, <clears throat> you know, CRS employees are, are really smart people. Um, they know that anything they write in a report is, in a matter of weeks, going to leach beyond the purely congressional audience. You have 20,000 congressional staff who are free to hand out CRS reports like candy. You have members who are happy to put them on their site. You have House.gov, Senate.gov posting CRS reports on various topics. They know it's going to happen. Uh, so it's not like, wow, gee, my stuff never leaked before. Suddenly the public's going to look at it. Egad, I'm going to change the way I write. No, that, that's just not, that's not operative. Um, Interestingly, if you kind of take a sociological look at the situation right now, um, the people who have the most access to CRS report tend to be the ones who are the most politically active, interested, and aggressive. They're the people here inside the Beltway who either pay for CRS reports through subscription services or they have connections on the Hill. Um, most of America is not nearly as uh, politically intense. Uh, so the kind of proposition that, by gosh, uh, if a high school student in Nebraska is going to have easier access to these reports, or a university professor in California is going to have better access to these reports, somehow CRS is going to change the content because they're going to be aggressively pursued by these dark forces. I, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. I, ju I just don't buy it. And I also think that, um, if anything, broader access to CRS reports would improve the quality of the reports, and uh, it could make CRS employees' lives a bit better. Now, this is all referencing a regime in which CRS, the agency itself, does not have to hand these things out. I don't think it should have to bother with that. It should focus on the research and serving Congress. It should not have to worry about public distribution issues. Let Congress do it. Um, experts get better at being experts by sharing their research with other people in their fields and getting feedback. Right now, CRS employees are severely constrained in their ability to do this. You go to a professional conference, you meet somebody, hey, you also study the Postal Service? I, I work on that for CRS. You can't just give them a copy of your report. No, instead, you would have to say, well, I could give you a copy, All but Congress first say, so I have to go back to a manager. I have to ask approval. I have to be able to prove that the uh, report itself, giving it to this academic, would somehow advance the interests of Congress. You know, what other researchers have to do that? Um, I, I can't tell you the number of times that I've, I ran into academics who happened to study stuff that I studied, and they had no idea because they could never find my stuff on the internet and it wasn't, you know, like I could hand it out and share it with them. I couldn't put it in my LinkedIn profile. Uh, so it, the current system, which is, you know, de jure secret but de facto available to folks inside the Beltway, I think it's a real hassle for CRS employees. What did you specialize in? Uh, I covered a bunch of stuff. Uh, a lot of postal work, uh, presidential vetoes, quasi-governmental entities, government corporations, government public relations. But you spent years just on those issues. So you Eleven know years. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How many reports did you do? You Dozens. I don't know. Not dozens. My dozens. God. I don't recall. Dozens. That means one a year. Come on. 
Representative, I do not recall. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, honest, I, I honestly don't know, and tremendous amount of work. I mean, it's funny, CRS reports are a small portion of the CRS analyst workload okay. because these days you get a tidal wave of emails coming in, and so you're doing kind of confidential interactions in that way. So, yeah, I mean, the CRS puts out, I don't know, 1,200 new reports each year. If you divide that amongst 400 researchers, you get about on average two to three reports per person maybe. So... Uh, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a hassle uh, because these reports are not published by Congress as a matter of course. Um, managers have to police the experts over there to make sure they're not giving them away to anybody who's not appropriate to give them away to. That's, that's a bother. Um, it's, you know, I'm not sure it really advances the professional interest of somebody <coughs> who's working as an expert at CRS um, to not be able to share your work to not be able to talk about reports that you have written unless Congress has clearly released them as a hearing print or uh, posted them on house.gov. So um, you are making a stronger argument than ever that these reports should be public because they're not, they're not a dime a dozen. And that's the reason I asked. I, I honestly thought it would be more. But you're basically saying, you know, so much is the research and the outcome is two or three reports a year. Yeah. yeah. So these are well thought out reports. Sorry, did you wanna, which way this yeah. go? Sorry, I know, we should have put you in the middle. Yeah, uh, that's that. <laughs> that, that, was, uh, that was my fault. So, uh, Prue, uh, libraries, access to the reports. So we've, we've talked about um, uh, the importance of having access to them. We've talked about some of the legal issues that have been raised. We've talked about from an analyst perspective. Um, you know, how it is beneficial to CRS and the people who work there and the general, but you, you have a, a different public perspective um, from, uh, from a library's perspective, from a public access perspective. How, how does it currently work in terms of how people get access to the reports and why is public access to CRS reports something that you've been working on for more than two decades now? Hmm. Thank you. Hold on, um, hold on, hold on. <laughs> there we go. First off, I think, I, I don't know how many of you realize it's Open Access Week, so I think it's very fitting that we are having a hearing about opening up the series. No, it's Open Access Week. We gotta work on this, yay, <laughs> go. <laughs> this is good, this is good. There are, there are literally thousands of events happening every day this week around the world. Um, it started out uh, years ago just with one event and it has just absolutely blossomed um, in every single country and it's really, really exciting to see um, countries take off around open access. There have been events every single day in South Africa, um, not to mention throughout academic institutions throughout the United States. So that's open access week. Um, so one of the things that I think you've all realized that the digital technologies really provide such an unprecedented amount of access to information, including government information. And having openly available information that's discoverable, that you can use for education, for innovation, and importantly, given what you're describing, the ability or inability to build on the work of others. I mean, I think that's one of the key things about having open, um, open information. And so in the, the libraries, every day we provide access to government information among other different kinds of collections, obviously. And <clears throat> we invest in both print and online access to CRS reports and all type of information because, as was described earlier, it is it is that access that allows the public to participate with, it, with their government and with their members of Congress. Um, and so we have always taken the position that government information should be timely, online, and freely available, um, including CRS reports, so that the users in our libraries going from K-12 to millennials to boomers to seniors um, can make informed judgments on issues and can work with their legislatures on these issues. Um, and it, these reports are in, immensely valuable for education at all levels. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I'm sure you realize is the wide range of issues. You just heard what Kevin worked on. I'm not sure we knew what you worked on when you were at C CRS. What did you work on, Daniel? I was going to have the mic up before you. <laughs> okay. Um, but I, I was just looking. Um, Federation of American Scientists had a, a blog this morning with just listing a huge number of CRS reports that just came online. And that is a place that you can find them at FAS. And it ranges from agriculture to Medicare, foreign policy, genetically engineered food. This is my favorite, 
copyright and the ability to fix cars and tractors, um, to rail safely and much, much more. And so from the perspective of our users, if you, um, well, think about yourself. If you're gonna start researching an issue, since a lot of you are interns from what I understand, um, you start with a Google search, which is terrific. Um, and Google's aim is to index all knowledge, all human knowledge, actually. And if you're a student, you start researching through Wikipedia. And those searches are really, really helpful and provide very good summaries on specific issues. But they don't have the depth and the context and the detail of a CRS report. And the reports are much more authoritative than the kinds of searches that you can do online which is why we go out of our way if we can collect these reports in addition to other government information and make them discoverable through the internet, um, which if they were on member sites, they would become much more discoverable these days. Um, it would be much um, more appealing and easier and discoverable if they were centralized in one place, particularly having the most current copy of a CRS report. Um, and building on something that was said earlier, um, we don't believe that libraries or individuals should have to pay for government information. It should be publicly available. A student who is researching a topic um, should not have uh, a barrier to access that in terms of a cost. And then I would also suggest that other federal agencies should not have barriers to access to CR CRS reports. They could be absolutely essential and integral to the work that they're doing on a policy or implementing a statute. Um, so with that, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Daniel. Thanks very much. And hands across America for uh, passing the microphone as well. Thank you, Congressman Quigley. Uh, so to answer Prue's question, so I was in the American Law Division, so I provided legal advice of varying quality to members of Congress and staff on uh, church state issues, telecommunications issues, and uh, national security issues. Uh, so if there was ever a, a religiously motivated terrorist that used a cell phone bomb, that probably would have been a very busy day for me. Uh, fortunately, that did not happen, at least uh, during my tenure. Could we clarify one thing? You, you, not just, you don't just produce reports, but I would have correspondence <coughs> from CRS uh, as well. So explain what that is. Sure, and, and things may have changed since I was there, but at least when I was there, um, you have a number of different types of inquiries that come in. So uh, one is you can have uh, an email inquiry. They, they were more disfavored when I was there. Uh, CRS eventually moved to allow, allow you to respond back without having to get approval uh, from your manager to do so. Uh, so you can have uh, email inquiries, you can have phone inquiries, where uh, if someone calls CRS or they call you directly, you can answer the questions that they have. Uh, that's more informal, so you could be a little bit uh, more comprehensive in, in the way that you would answer. So staff might call you up, and you might not have a report written on it, but you could provide them information. Yes. So you're doing lots more than just writing reports. That's I right. wanted that on the record, so you didn't think that it was the best job in the world to have. And there's also, there's also confidential memoranda. So a member office will contact you, and they want information, but they don't want the rest of the world to necessarily know about it. Uh, so you would write a con and most of what I did was these confidential memoranda. Uh, and those would go through the review process, and we can talk about that later if folks are interested. One point to uh, yeah. supplement what uh, the representative said sure. um, on balance. Uh, lobbyists and others are constantly uh, providing legal advice on proposed legislation. Um, and the, the conventional wisdom is that essentially Congress is always outlawed because the high-priced downtown lawyers are busy churning this stuff out. Well, the only place that a member can turn to for counterbalancing legal advice that has any of the stature, I mean, they can go to the law schools, they can go to people like me volunteering, but their own in-house capability That's to awesome. match the legal resources of the outside is significantly um, diminished without the CRS. That doesn't always make them right, but what emerges from advocacy on both sides of an issue is some sense of the correct answer. And so I think an exposing CRS's legal analysis to the world, in my view, strengthens it because it forces the vetting process inside the CRS to be very thorough and very careful knowing that their work will be reviewed by other lawyers. That is a way which that will enhance the reputation and the standing of the CRS in the world, which is important 
if you're worried about balancing external interests with the ability of the Congress. So that's my speech for today. And let, let's add a good speech. And, and let's add a point to that as well. And then we're going to go to questions from the audience. Uh, and this is something that you had that, the, that you had started with Congressman Chase, which is the usefulness in having a dialogue uh, at CRS when you're producing this these, this type of you know as someone who's been out of CRS now for a decade now, um, maybe more. Uh, oftentimes you find mistakes in these reports. It is not uncommon to find errors because CRS reports are produced under oftentimes tremendous time pressure. Uh, and it's impossible to know everything and to do everything. And although the review process is good, it's not always perfect. There's always more information. The role of CRS is to provide the best possible advice to Congress. Uh, and if CRS's advice process can be improved by having communications with folks on the outside, whether it's through what Kevin was talking about, which is going to conferences and having access to other experts, being able to share information with them, being able to, to draw upon their knowledge, or when you put out a report, many of these reports, uh, there's one here that it's updated over time. Uh, well, if there's a mistake in there, sometimes it's something as simple as a mathematical error, or there's a comma in the wrong place, or you forgot a zero, and sometimes uh, there's more significant problems that can arise in the reports as well, in terms of sometimes there can be a balance issue or missing. And having that feedback mechanism, having the ability to have that conversation uh, in, in a way that is appropriate, uh, will only enhance the purpose for which CRS exists, which is, of course, to get give the best possible advice to Congress. So, so some danger, though, it, you know, going to uh, and speaking at events. Now, taking the other side, just the caution is, we deal with so many celebrities. I mean, they speak at a conference, the next thing you know, they're on uh, Good Morning Joe or there's something else. The last thing I want is to have the CRS folks become celebrities or advocates um, so that's the one caution I want. I, I want them to be in the background. I want them to be able to get the information, but I want them to be in the background. Yeah. There are very few people now who are in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so, and with that, are there questions uh, from the audience? So, Danielle, and sorry, this is going to be awkward with the microphone, but that's she all right. represents one of the finest organizations. Oh, thank you, Congressman. Um, great panel. Thank you. He's, um, you're obviously right. You're all making really good arguments for why this should happen. I was involved probably 15 or 20 years ago with a press conference on the Senate side with senators. Was it? Uh, Senator, well, you were there. And also Senators Le um, Leahy and McCain introducing their legislation. Why has this not happened yet? I mean, this is obviously a good idea. It's, it's not a new idea. So what are the reasons why this hasn't happened yet? One reason is that members of Congress uh, like getting access to information that wouldn't potentially be shared with their opponents. So if they sound brilliant on some well-written report, uh, they're not eager that some candidate can get all this information and come to debates sounding just as articulate. Mm -hmm. That's a big reason. Is there any way to get around that? Um, well, it's not a good reason. No, it's not a good reason, but that's the re you know a big reason. They like the information to be just theirs. They may not even want other members to have it. If they've thought of a really cool question that CRS is going to write up about, they'd just as soon own it. I mean, I'm giving you the the big reason, and the other reason is there's uh, the there aren't a lot of advocates for this. Partly because it seems so obvious you think it'd be done. But, you know, I mean, I really appreciate all of you being here. But it's kind of like, when you think about it, so obvious that it should happen that you don't even feel you should have to have a meeting like this, honestly. Yep. And as, as someone, I haven't worked on it as long as, as, as Danielle has and, or as you have, but there's also CRS is engaged in communications on this issue in the background. There are memos that they send to members of Congress saying, don't do this, and here's a bunch of reasons why. And the people that they rely on for non-confidential, uh, for confidential advice, are the same ones who are saying you shouldn't do this because of speech or debate. Well, but, but isn't that example. different though? When they're advising you, it's not a report. We're not talking about. Right. We're not talking right. about that kind that's of right. communication being public. Right. Well, maybe they think it's the camel's head under the tent. That's that's they're... exactly right. They, they, one is that they think it's the 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 nose of the camel. The the other is that there are funding concerns. 
that they have. Uh, I don't think, in, in, if you look historically at CRS's funding over the last 20, 25 years, it suffered significant cuts. Um, the number well, of staff are cost? It's on the, it's so CRS currently is appropriated about $100 million no, a year no, no, for their course. No, 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 but what's the cost? It's, it's, in, it's electronically available. I mean, they don't have to pay printing costs. Oh. They don't, I they didn't don't say it was a good argument. <laughs> no, but it's not even an argument. I mean, it can't be. Because in other words, there are some things that could be, you know, mm -hmm. it's a cost. But is but there a cost? No, but I'd say one other element to answer Danielle's question. It's the inevitable tension between the old ways that we do things and technology. Oh, that's that, a, and that goes answer. on not just in this area. It that's goes on answer. across the board legally. The law doesn't catch up to technology. It can't. Um, you know, we're, we're working question. under a 1976 Copyright Act. Um, so, <laughs> so that's a tension. And I think it just makes people nervous to think that this stuff will be out there. Um, when in effect, it's already out there. Right, and, and, the, and to, the, to the cost question, so where that came from, there's a provision in appropriations, uh, it's a rider that's been introduced every year since 1952. And what it says is that um, unless you have the, pr the permission of uh, uh, the Committee on House Administration or Senate Rules Committee, you cannot make or available CRS, you cannot make available Library of Congress reports, because CRS wasn't CRS and it was the, uh, uh, without this authorization. And the reason was then, so I spent a lot of time figuring this out. There's actually, you can find the colloquy, uh, side of the conversation, and it was because of the cost of mailing to women's groups. That's literally what the, um, the explanation was, uh, at least in the, in the 50s. I want to give you another reason. Yes. The other reason is that um, there are groups way far to the left and way far to the right that are going to get a hold of a copy of a report. They're going to say, inside the Congress is this illicit group that is advocating for global warming uh, and read what they said in this report and it was by so-and-so or they'll, you know, and, uh, and the next thing you know, there'll be legislation to get rid of CRS. There will be because I can just see Hannity having it on a program. Government paid. Yeah, people. government paid people, Advocating. Uh, influence, yeah. lobbyists within the government. I mean, I could have fun with this one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get them. <laughs> Did you, what's that? Yeah. Oh, Craig? Uh, Craig? There, there is some irony that CRS researchers will call me and ask for information, but when I call them to ask for information, they won't even answer the phone. But that's not my question. My question is, <laughs> is CRS itself opposed to disclosure, uh, to opening up their reports? Who do you mean by CRS? <laughs> I'm not sure how CRS is structured, but I presume the current leadership of CRS, are they opposed to this? There has been long-standing opposition by the leadership of CRS to opening up the reports publicly. It's kind of benign opposition. It's like, don't rock the boat, I think, isn't it? No, it's, no, no. I think it's Actually, more entrenched. <laughs> this is fun. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, I can I can say from experience when members of Congress have introduced legislation on this part, they get a letter from CRS. I have it. I send it to the to the panels in advance that says, not that they oppose it, right? Well, but but they, but they say that we have concerns, right? Uh, they don't say these are the reasons why you think you should do it. It's not you know. It's we have these following concerns, regardless of the legitimacy of the, like one of the concerns they raise has to do with copyright protection. Uh, one, of course, public documents are not subject to copyright, but if there's a material that's quoted in a CRS report that uh, may have come from another source that would be, that it may be covered by copyright, they have that's a- fair use. Of course it's fair use. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a good, and GAO has this exact- That's why Congress passed the fair use exception in the copyright law. Now, there's a big argument about what, how far that goes, but I don't think anyone would seriously consider, cons, uh, you know, contend that a statement repeated in a CRS report is not fair use. No, I mean, it, right, and what GAO does is they have a statement in all of their reports, and what the statement says is that some of this material may be copyrighted and you use it at your, at your own risk, and that, That's fine. and that addresses the problem. And it, there is a, uh, a, when you guys came in, and for folks who are online, there is a letter that was written by 40 organizations that went through all of the commonly raised CRS concerns everything from copyright, from, uh, I'm, I'm blanking, but uh, speech or debate clause, and addressed each one of those concerns with either ways of, of fixing it, 
or saying that this is not really a concern. Just pardon me putting on my defense lawyer hat, but in fairness to the Congressional Research Service management, I understand why they want to walk a fine line of neutrality. Yeah. Because they are constantly being berated by people who say, just as the representative has, that they're being used for partisan purposes, even if they themselves don't have them. So they are extremely sensitive to the position they have, and they want to protect that uh, nonpartisan, you know, inviolability. And so I read between the lines of their position of, we're not in favor of this, and we want you to be concerned, but I don't think the roof is going to come off the, the Library of Congress hmm. if, if this gets passed mm -hmm. inside the Congressional Research Service. Kevin? Yeah, the... Um the debate over this issue is uh, it, it's interesting because Congress has got a long history of publishing CRS reports as committee prints or introducing CRS work into the public record. Uh, not long ago, I pulled a 1979 CRS annual report, and there were dozens of reports dozens upon dozens upon dozens that Congress had released to the public in the form of committee prints. They were shot out to all the depository libraries and all that sort of thing. Um, when talk of making it a, like an official policy that CRS reports be automatically made public, when that was initiated, uh, the onus was originally by advocates put on the agency itself. You were telling an agency that was used to working in the background as a support agency to suddenly become this kind of public facing, we're going to crank out our reports. And that created well-founded anxiety. And that well-founded anxiety, unfortunately, still lingers today, despite the fact that Quigley Lance proposition does not say UCRS has to do it. Rather, it follows the well-trod congressional tradition that it's the responsibility of Congress to publish these things. It's Congress's cost, what little, if any, there will be. Uh, and so it's not, it's not novel. It's a question of degree. I mean, every year Congress publishes some number of CRS reports one way or another, either whacking them up on House.gov or Senate.gov or putting them out as committee prints. Some number of CRS products get out there. This would just increase the number. So that the, the feeling that you sometimes get from those uh, inside CRS that, no, 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 this is completely different. This is changing our mission and changing our nature. I think that's a reaction to uh, a conversation that happened long, long ago. And I would say that if there was one real concern I would have uh, for analysts, and I, I fully sympathize, is that the idea that having your, you know, your reports go out and on the name, your ba on the back of the report is your name, your telephone extension, and your email address. The fear that, you know, okay, if now a million people instead of only 10,000 or 20,000 read my report, I'm going to get so much more emails and phone calls of people who disagree with me. That's not an unreasonable extrapolation, but it's also very fixable. You simply remove the phone number. Yeah. You could put a hyperlink to the CRS analyst's private CRS analyst page, which means only congressionals could click through. It's, it's fixable to meet that, that sort of concern. I would add that um, the sister agencies like GAO and CBO have made their reports publicly available, and I don't, I don't think, at least I've not heard when I've talked to them, that they have <coughs> continuing concerns with that kind of public access. And I agree with Kevin that there are ways to fix the sort of putting the analyst right out there in front of the universe. Um, but there may be some conversations that could be, that can continue between GAO, CBO, and, and CRS um, to see if there's a way to get beyond some of the concerns that you raise. So uh, concluding comments or thoughts from the panel? Is there anything that you've been wanting, dying to say and you haven't had a chance to say yet? No, I just want to thank you all for coming. You know, it's, um, if no one came, um, that would be sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think we can't say much more than that. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Uh, appreciate it. Atres 34, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Well Thank done. You so well done. Thank you not only for the comments, but also for helping with the microphone. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, Danielle, are you taking me out to lunch?